Okay, so today we're going to go over some of the basics that surround language and what it means in its location, what it means in its relationship with others. So first of all, we have to review what are some of the major influences on a culture. We've been studying previously with pop and folk culture how culture can evolve around material goods. Now we're going to start delving into people's beliefs, and language is the beginning of all that because language is how you communicate a culture's beliefs and so you see that language is a critical component and then it comes back to ethnicity with where you hang the people you, who you connect with and then religion that influences some of your core beliefs so let's first of all investigate language and then later on we'll investigate the other so why is language so important to culture let's talk about a few things that language can do first of all language can bind people together if you speak the same language you're going to connect with each other and stay together what we're going to see is we're going to see some countries where language is very difficult because they all speak different languages. Language also helps communicate behaviors. This happens very early on. Think about when you're a child and your parent does something and you mimic it, they often will explain why they did that. Or let's say you practice a behavior that your culture doesn't connect with or doesn't seem appropriate then they use language to help communicate that that's not acceptable and that continues throughout life. Language will also preserve traditions. The key element to this is the ability to write things down and so c cultures who did not have a written language often found their tradition go by the wayside when a dominant culture would appear because it wasn't written down and so languages have been cr core to preserving traditions one of the things that people did for a lot of Native Americans is they took the oral languages and then they would figure out a way to write it down because they were trying to preserve those languages. Okay, now one quick correction needs to be made at your notes at this point. So um, I put that this is a language group. We actually need to change this because the following definition is a definition of language family. And so in your notes, go ahead and just make this correction that this is going to be language family instead. And what a family is, is the family really is a good descriptor of this, is it's a group of language that have something in common, a common language, but they've evolved differently. So you could think about with your own family how you all have parents, and maybe your siblings are a little bit different than your parents, but you're still fairly close, just a few differences. And then the farther, farther back, maybe there are more differences as you go back, think about your great-great-grandparents. If you met someone who was also from the same great-great-grandparent, you have that in common, but things might have changed over time. Language are the same thing. They have a family where they had that original language, and then over time they evolved into different types of So let's go, um, let me kind of show you how this looks like as we look at English, because languages are always constantly changing. So this is English around a thousand years ago, and I want you just to take a moment and look at it and see if you can figure out what it's saying. Because it's English, we should be able to know it, right? Now I'm going to show you the same phrase but a few hundred years, or a couple hundred years later, this is in 14 AD, and I want you to see if you can see any words that you recognize now. Okay, now we're going to get a little bit more modern. Once again, these are the same phrases, but it gives a really good job of showing how language changes over time. And so you have these different languages from the same family who maybe looked the same thousands of years ago, but over time they've changed and evolved. So let's look at some of the dominant languages that you see there. So 45% of the world speaks languages from the Indo-European family. And so most of the, almost half of the people speak languages that have the same common core. 20% speak languages from the Sino-Tibetan family, and 30% speak seven other languages families. 
So if you look at this kind of mathematically, you have one dominant group that comes from Indo-European, you have one dominant group that comes from Sino-Tibetan, and then you do have other small families, but they're not as big and they're not as influential. And then you have a small 5% that speak more than a hundred smaller language families. So you can see there's a lot of diversity, but overall it's two language family groups that dominate who those are. So those names seem a little weird, um, like Indo-European, Sino-Tibetan, but if you look and break down the word, it actually makes a lot more sense where they're coming from. Okay, so let's go ahead and dissect. So one of the largest families, almost half of the world speaks these languages, comes from the Indo-European family. And the name gives it away where this uh, language originated from and also whose languages come from it. So you have Indo, and so what you have here is you have a lot of the India languages found their roots in this family ancestry. And then you also see that the European languages fall into this family too. So the Indo-European is an ancestor language that they believe started perhaps here in India and spread over to Europe. Now obviously if you were to go into Germany and then go into India they're going to speak different languages. But the idea is, is way back in time they had a common ancestor that bound these languages together. Sino-Tibetan, this one's a little bit more tricky, but if you remember it's the second largest family group. And the reason why it's the second largest family group is due to one of the languages that is spoken there. And that language is Chinese. And I mean, that country of China alone has one billion people. So it makes sense why this is one of the largest family groups, because one of the dominant languages is spoken by the largest country in the world. Now, the reason why it's called Sino-Tibetan is there's a physical feature out here called the Tibetan Plateau. And so that's where it gets its roots, is the Sino-Tibetan. So this one, the name doesn't help you out as much, but what it does do is it gives you an idea this is the second largest. And so if you think about that, it helps you realize this is the one that's located in East Asia. Now some of the other smaller groups that you have there is you have the Niger-Congo. And once again, in this case, the name helps you out. Niger with Nigeria, Congo where you have the Democratic Republic of Congo, you have the Republic of Congo here in Central. So these is a language family where a lot of the African languages are bound together. And then you have Afro-Asiatic, and so Afro dealing with Africa, and then dealing with the Middle East as well. So this is part of Western Asia. So it's the part of the world where Africa and Asia meet particularly in North Africa and the Middle East. And then Austronesia does not actually include Australia because the dominant language spoken in Australia is English, so it would belong to the Indo-European, but it's within this region that surrounds Australia. So Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, those are all dealing with the Austronesian family group there. So let's dissect some of the language groups that's found in the Indo-European and some of these you will need to fill out. So in the Indo-European it has several groups um, with there. So you have the Germanic group and the Germanic group is actually broken off further into the North Germanic. This is where you get the Danish language, the Iceland language, um, those that spoke Norway, Norwegian, Sweden, Swedish, and then West Germanic. This is actually where English falls into place. We are most closely associated with German and with Dutch. Now, Indo-Iranian, so India and Iran. In the east, you have Hindi, which is the largest language that's spoken in India. And then in the west, in Iran, you have a couple different languages of Persian, Pashto, and Kurdish. And then the Balto-Slavic, um, you have East Slavic. This is where Russia, Russian's going to play into role. And its nearby neighbors have a very similar language with Ukraine and Belarusian. And then if you go farther west and south, this is where you see Slavic, Polish, Czech, and Slovak. And then you have one more large group called the Romance languages. This is where their common ancestor is Latin. And so you have Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Italian. So the whole idea is if you learn one language in these groups, 
you can carry over a lot of that into other groups as well because they have that common ancestor to bind them together. So let's look into the Sino-Tibetan language group and this is a great example that shows how families aren't, like if you're in from a different family it's going to be very different. So we looked at the Indo-European languages, now we're going to look at the Sino-Tibetan and of course we talked about this, it's spoken in China, the largest country, but here is how this family varies much differently than the Indo-European family. Chinese languages actually are connected through writing with that and what they do is their language isn't based on sound but their language instead uses the images for words and so if you look at here this right here is an image for mother now in the English language how we would figure out mother is we would look at the word and sound out the sounds where we know M stands for M and then you would look at the vowels and so forth. China doesn't base their language on sounds, instead it bases them on symbols. Now the good thing about that is because it's symbol based, it's very connective, it allows China to be connected even if there's some variation. The difficulty with that of course is you'd have to learn thousands upon thousands of symbols for the words there. But it's a great example that shows how this family, the Sino-Tibetan, connects or is very different than the Indo-European. Now because so many people in China are able to connect through the writing of this language, it allows them to be bind together as compared to India where a lot of their languages are phonetic and are spoken, then they have a hard time connecting with each other because that language doesn't bind them together. Now Austronesia is another language family group we looked at. It's found in Indonesia. The um, long largest language in this family is called Javanese. Austroasiatic, um, in this family group, the largest language spoken is Vietnamese. And then Japanese and Korean are kind of interesting in that they don't have branches off. Japan is very unique all to itself as its own family group, and Korea is its own family group as well. Now, Japanese does use some logo logograms, so the symbols but it also makes a little bit with phonetics as well. And then Korea actually follows the sounds of the phonetic. So Jap just remember in this case that Japanese are, are unique languages. They have no other family members and they're separate from each other. Japanese language is its own family. Korean language is its own family. They're not connected with each other. Now Afroasiatic we talked about is the area in Western Asia and North Africa and the two largest languages in this one is Arabic and this was spread through the religion of Islam and then Hebrew which also is connected in this case to the religion of Judaism and then there's another fam small family group called Altaic in this case the language is Turkish and then Uralic um, is kind of interesting where most European languages are from that family Indo-European but these three countries are a little bit different. They have their own language group they're coming from with Estonia, Finland, and Hungary. So their language acts and feels differently than the rest of Europe. Niger-Congo is actually very, very diverse. There's no dominant language and we're going to talk about later on how that creates a problem when a country is trying to unify and they have so many different languages in that family. And then there's an, a small, small family group called the Kwasan. And this is actually interesting where they use the clicking sounds to communicate rather than vowel sounds to communicate. So we talked about language family. So underneath language family there are language groups. And these are groups who are still different from each other but their ancestor was more recent. So think about if you went to a family reunion and it's your great 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 grandfather. There's going to be a lot of different people there. But if you went to a family reunion and it was your grandfather, you're going to be more alike. And so language groups are more alike. They have typical word structures. Let me show you language groups. So the Romance is a language group. So you've got Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Italian. And if you look on the right, they're both, in all four of those languages, they're saying the same thing. They're saying, I love snow. 
and you can see similarities here. For example, the Romance languages often will give the pronouns, or sorry, like the in the English language before it, and they can masculine and feminize those descriptors. And so you can and you can see right here the word snow is very similar, just a few spelling differences. So group languages have more similarities than family languages. If you learn Spanish, you might be more easily able to learn Portuguese. Or if you learn French, you're more easily able to learn Spanish. And then, of course, in languages themselves, you have different dialects. And this means they're still speaking the same langu individual language, but they have some variations. It could be variations in vocabulary. So one of the best examples here in the United States is soda versus pop, where some parts of the United States use different words, but we're both speaking English. It's just our dialects are different. Spelling might be different. So in England, you may see theater spelled with a T-R-E at the end, where here in the United States, you may see it spelled T-E-R at the end. Once again, still speaking English, but the spelling might be a little variance with dialects. And then pronunciation. This is where you get accents of people pronouncing words differently. And one of the best examples of that, of course, is English. We've got a lot of different dialects of English. There's American English, which has various dialects. You have British Eng English, Indian English, Australian English, Canadian English. So you can go into those countries and you'll still speak the languages, but there might be some variation in either vocabulary, spelling, or pronunciation of the words.